Mic on? Maybe not? Okay. All right, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, we're happy that you are here at the 8 for our final talk of our series called Eyewitness. If this is your first time attending uh, our series here of Eyewitness, all our previous four talks for this series are on our website at stmarkatl.church, either on our YouTube channel or a podcast, uh, our church podcast. If you just type in stmarkatl.church, you'll be able to see our podcast and, and catch up on all our, our previous talks of the series titled Eyewitness. Christian or not, spiritual or not, religious or not, Many of us have asked the question, if there is a God, if there is a higher being, this invisible higher being, and he wants us to know, he wants us to know him, why can't he be super clear? Like, why is he complicated? Why is it as if he's trying to hide something behind his back? Like, why is he so mysterious? If God it really wants us to know him, why does he make himself super clear? I feel if we ask that question to God, God would have been like, like what? What do you want me to do? Like, what would I have to do to convince you that I'm here and I desire a relationship with you? What, like, what would you want me to do? Like, how about I create a rock that sustains life and everything is in perfect balance just by the perfect access of this rock called planet Earth? Maybe if I did that, would you believe that I exist? Or how about this? By the time I finish this sentence... 50,000 cells in my human body die and they automatically replenish themselves. What if a God designed a human being in that, in, like that? Would that make us believe in God? Or how about this? What if God took two cells, two cells, and in a way, as of right now in 2019, science has no explanation of this, that these two cells come together and over a matter of weeks, an electrical impulse is spontaneously started to, to begin a heartbeat that lasts a lifetime, moving blood approximately five miles per hour throughout the entire body. What if God did that? Would that make us think, yeah, yeah there is a God? Sometimes we're trying to look for something so extreme for God to do. Like, why doesn't he just like, show a miracle when in reality, God... This divine being who calls us to call him father is so apparent, but he's so apparent to the point that we don't even see him, that we don't even see him. Like I mentioned, we are in our final talk of our series called Eyewitness here at the 8 at San Mark Church, and we've been looking at a first eyewitness. Where are we now? This, we're at a first eyewitness of St. John. So there's four records of Jesus' life, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So we've been focusing on the, the, the record and the writing of St. John, who was a fisherman, who was a fisherman, who became curious of Jesus and decided to pursue him, and he became a first eyewitness, and his life was rocked. Many historians say that how he wrote his last, uh, how he wrote his record of Jesus' life was near the end of his life. So many of his friends were telling him, John, like, you were like, you a first eyewitness. You saw so many crazy things that Jesus did, and you were the one appointed to take care of Jesus' mother. But we don't have much writings from you. You've told us stuff, you know, as we drink coffee and tea, you tell us about things. But we don't have anything in writing. And, and the way you're looking, I mean, it doesn't look like you're going to be around here that much longer. So John decided to write down his record and his experience as a first eyewitness with Jesus. And many historians have appointed that the person that helped him write the gospel was a deacon named Prochorus. And that's him in the, in the icon. And John is, is, is telling his record. And the deacon is writing down his experience or writing down the fourth gospel, as we know, as the gospel according to St. John. So what's so unique about St. John's writing that it's very unique from Matthew, Mark, and Luke? So he records it in this format. St. John records events, which points to signs, which give evidence that Jesus is not just a fabulous rabbi, but he's actually God incarnate, which show his identity, his entire format of how St. John writes his gospel. It's not just writing down what Jesus did. Jesus did this, and then he did this miracle, and then he walked over here and did this. He did, he's not just writing about historical facts just to show evidence that he did X, Y, and Z. But he was pointing to who Jesus is, just to show his vulnerability and his realness of how St. John wrote. He wrote this near the end of his gospel. 
But these are written. All these things that I've shown you, all these signs, all these miracles that I pointed and I documented and showed you evidence that I saw as a first eyewitness, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, not you just believe, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but by believing, by, by believing and putting your trust in him, you may have life in his name. He's writing this with an agenda. Not just for a nice story that can sell and be one of the top selling books of all times. No. To point for us to have life. If you are reading in a physical Bible, if anybody still remembers what that is, there is there will be a, a, a headline in the beginning of the ninth chapter of, of, of the Gospel of St. John, where it's, it's titled, Healing of a Blind Man. Just to give you some geographical context, Jesus was moving back and forth, north to south, north to south, between Jerusalem and Galilee. And he's bouncing back and forth between these two cities. And this is where we pick up in the ninth chapter. As Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, Jesus, who sinned, like this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So the ancient mentality of the first century, which many of us might still have today, which is life is all about cause and effect, cause and effect. So logically, the disciples saw a man sitting there born blind. So they said, okay, all right, this is not complicated. How did he get to this situation? Did he do something bad? Did his mom do something bad? Actually, a, 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 a tale or a fable back then was that even if a mother, when she was pregnant, she walked into a pagan temple, just walking into a pagan temple, that she is doomed. Her, her child will, will have some type of paralysis or be blind. That was just, they just thought in that simplistic way that there was a cause and effect that occurred. And for a lot of us, we think, oh, this happened at work because I did this, or this happened to my family because of whatever. We like to simplify it down to a logic. And we bring it down to two things. What did I do for this to occur? Or somebody else did something to me. There's an external force that occurred this to happen in my life. And we bring it down to those two factors of why many things have happened in our lives. This is how our logic is. Jesus answers, neither. Neither. This guy nor his parents. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened. So that, so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Maybe there's a third option. Where God, the one who has the universe and the galaxies in the palm of his hand, maybe creates us to have hard times, hardships, or flaws. For him to shine forth through that. And I know I'm not the only one that has experienced this. You've seen somebody in hardship, either through a physical ailment or through something in their marriage or something in their life. And through their pain, you saw their faith. You saw their trust in their living Savior. And maybe we won't admit it. We're a little bit jealous. That even through darkness, we see light shining through them. God, in his mysterious ways, works through our weakness, through our hardships, in order for his light to shine through us. Maybe pain can have a purpose. And many of us, again, I'm not the only one that have seen God shine through each other's weakness or through other people's weakness. As long as, listen to this, so that's what Jesus said. But this happened, the works of God might be displayed in him. In typical Jesus fashion, now he completely shifts the conversation as if it seems completely random and unrelated to the disciples and Jesus hanging out with this blind man. Jesus says this, as long as it's day, as long as it's day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. And he completely shifts the conversation. I'm sure the disciples are a little bit confused. Okay, yeah, it's, yeah, you're here. The, it's light. It's not day. Duh. Okay, wh where is this going? And Jesus is saying, while I'm still here, I'm here to bring healing. While I am still with you, I'm here to show you the fullness of life. While I'm still here with you, I'm here to show you who your heavenly Father is. After saying this, Jesus spat on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. 
And then Jesus said something to this blind man. Jesus told something to the blind man in which Jesus tells me the same thing. And Jesus tells you the same thing. Go. Go, Jesus told him. Wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. Jesus asked this man to walk by faith and not by sight. Literally. He told him to walk by faith. Jesus asked him to put his trust in his word, even though he did not have all the answers to everything. And maybe God is asking me to do the same. To take, steep, to take steps into the unknown. Take a bold step in life. Even though you don't have all the answers to everything. But take a step toward me. He did something your heavenly father wants you to do the same. The man, the blind man, chose to trust someone he could not see based on rumors. This blind man has heard, as he's sitting there blind, he's heard people talk about this rabbi named Jesus from Nazareth. He's heard people talk about him. But obviously he's never seen him. And all of a sudden Jesus comes to him, took some, some mud, took some dirt, spit on it, threw it in his face, and then he, he had to take a bold step, purely basing his faith on rumors of what he heard about Jesus. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same guy? Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, no, he looks like him. But he himself insisted, I'm the man. How then were your eyes opened? They asked. He relied. The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. Where is this man? They asked him. I don't know. I don't know where he is. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was the Sabbath. Once again, an additional drum is added to the scene. Because here are the hotshot religious leaders watching this whole thing go down. But they're keeping track what day of the week it is. And they're just trying to wait for Jesus to make a mistake, make a fault, just so they can point fingers Look at this rabbi. He doesn't even know the Torah. He doesn't even know the scripture. And he's making a wrong move on the wrong day. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied. And I washed, and now I see. I'm not the smartest guy in the world. All I know is that I was blind, but now I see. I can't tell you the mechanism or the chemical formula that happened. I don't know. He put some dirt. I don't know what he did with that dirt before. I couldn't really see. And he threw it on my face. And then I took a, a step toward washing it, even though I had no idea what the outcome was going to be. All I know is I was blind. Now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God. He does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. The Pharisees, the religious leaders, saw with their own two eyes. Like the disciples are sitting right there. John is sitting there probably recording all of this, writing some, some notes on a side of a piece of paper. And the Pharisees are seeing all this occur. And the only thing they're focused on is Jesus is doing this miracle on the Sabbath. And they're so focused on that, that how can Jesus do something like that, that there's no way that what I just saw is not reality. The reason why they could not see it is because they put God in a box. God does not work like that. God knows this is a Sabbath. So anything that occurs outside of that is not from God. And they've limited God to only working in these ways. This is the only way God works. God doesn't work outside of that. You have to do X, Y, and Z in order to be a child of God. Not that way. And they were blind to seeing God because they put God in a box. Then they turned again to the blind man. What, have to, what do you have to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, maybe, maybe he's a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. So now they're wanting to investigate. They're really, the Pharisees and the scribes, the Jewish leaders, are really wanting to get to the bottom of this. Okay, you know what? Let's ask mom and dad. Maybe they know something we don't. We, what, we, what we just experienced can't be true. Let's get to the bottom of this. Let's ask his parents. They asked, is this your parent? Is this your son? They asked, is this the one you say was born blind? 
How is it that you now, how is it that now he can see? The parents say, we know he's our son, the parents answered. And we know he was born blind. But how he can see, how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. We're clueless just like you are. Ask him. He's an adult. He's a big boy. You ask him how that happened. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided. The Jewish leaders already had a conclusion of how this mystical thing that happened outside of physical science, how this occurred, they already came to a conclusion how this happened. Because they already jumped to a conclusion of how God works. They know how God works. They know their Bible. They know their scripture. They know their Torah. They know this cannot happen on the Sabbath. They already came to a conclusion. They already shoved God in a box. They already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would not be put out, would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. A second time, they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner, he replied. Whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. I, I, I don't, is he a prophet? Is he a sinner? I, I don't know. I, don't, I can't tell you who he is. One thing I do know, I was blind. I was empty. And I tried to fill that with some other things in my life with a relationship, with a vacation, with a whatever. I tried to fill that with other things, but it wasn't doing it. I was blind, but now I see. How that happened, I don't know. I can't tell you. I can't tell you the label of who this guy is. I can't even tell you what day of the week it is. All I know is that my life was empty, was in darkness, but now it's in light. I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a big philosophical, intellectual guy. I, I don't know. All I know is in darkness, but now I'm in light. This is something that's true for you and me. You want to understand everything before you believe something. You want to understand everything before you believe something. Don't we do the same? Not really. What else is this true in your life? Tell me what, what other aspect of life is this true? I just got on three planes to get from Zambia to Atlanta. Did I, it's before I jumped on a plane. Okay, I need someone to explain to me the physics of how this huge piece of metal Covering, holding 300 people fly into the sky. Can someone explain? Like, did I sit there and pause? I need to understand this before I take one step into the plane. <laughs> before you take this out, I need to understand how do I have the entire world of all the information at the, at the tips of my, right here in my fingers, in my, in my, in my, in my pocket. You don't do that. You don't, you don't do that with anything. So why do you do the same with your heavenly father? The Jewish leaders they had willful blindness, intentional blindness. They intentionally and willfully decided not to see what they wanted to see. Because God fit in that box, anything outside of the box is a no-go. They had confirmation bias. They knew how God works, they knew the law, they knew the rights, they knew the rules, they knew the canons, they knew the whatever. But God working outside of that, that doesn't work. They had confirmation bias. They had willful blindness of one, seeing what they want to see and turning the other way from what was a reality in front of them. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I know, I was blind, I was in darkness, but now I'm in light, and now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? Tell us. How did he open your eyes? Tell us exactly how did he do. How did he do that to you? Then they asked him again, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already. Don't you hear the words coming out of my mouth? And you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Are you wanting to become his disciple or something? Like, he's getting fed up at this point. Like, I've already told Like, how many times do you want me to say it to you? Like, you're, you're, you're blind to seeing it. Like, you keep on asking me the same question. Unless you have an, another ulterior motive, like you're wanting to become his disciple and no one admit it or something. But I've already told you. Don't overcomplicate this. I was in darkness, but now I'm in light. Because... Of Jesus. You want to give him whatever label, that's fine. But he came and touched me with his love and filled that void inside of me that was empty. I'm not that smart, but I know where I was and I know where I am now. I love this quote from an Orthodox bishop. It is not the task of Christianity 
to provide easy answers to every question, but to make us progressively aware of a mystery. God is not so much the object of our knowledge as the cause of our wonder. As I mentioned in the liturgy sermon, sometimes we feel as Christians that we need to have the answers for everything. But that's not our goal. It's a mystery. It's above our intellect. The designer of our intellect is above our intellect, as logical as that sounds, but we forget about that elementary truth. The designer of our intellect is above our intellect. And this is why in our ancient faith, in our pre-denominational faith, the church throughout the centuries would never describe God by saying he is X, Y, and Z. Actually, they would use words to describe what he is not. And they would call this apophatic theology. Apophatic theology. They would say God is ineffable. Like there's no words for me to describe who he is. Say God is incomprehensible. Like we would describe who he is not. Okay. We would, just, we would use words to describe who he is not. Because there's no, like once I put a word of who he is, that limits him. Once I say God is this, then I've, I've put a limit. Even the words that we do use to describe who he is, if I say God is great, God is love, love tell, me, tell, tell me, what's the boundary of what is love and what is not? If divine agave love, what's the boundary of that? For me to say that God is great, what's the, what's the limit to what greatness is? This is why in our ancient prayers, what is the focus is describing what God is not. Because there's no words in our intellect, in our linguistics, in our vocabulary to, 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 to point to who God is. The second we do that, we run into the trap of putting him into a box. Perhaps, perhaps God is bigger than you thought he was. Perhaps God is bigger than you thought he was. Here's a cooker. Perhaps God is bigger than you were taught he was. No, no, no. This is my childhood experience. No, no, no. D dinosaurs, no, no, no. Evolution, no, no, no. Anything that comes to, to science, shh. Christians should be the most curious, open-minded people on planet Earth because our God is outside of any limit, out of any, any boundary. We should be the most curious and most accepting of what science has to tell us and see, and see what does that tell us about who our God is. But the second we hear of any trigger words, uh, we, then we turn the other way. No, 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 that's not, that's not God. That's not in the Bible. Come on. Is it, you're, you're, are we putting God into a box? Anything outside of the box is not true, is not from God? Uh, don't take this the wrong way, but I do not like the word secular. I do not like the word secular. Is it spiritual or secular? Because the, the, the more we start using that term, what do we end up doing? We put God into a box. Oh, that's secular music. That, that's, the second we start doing that, then we're, we're putting a line. This is God and this is outside of God. The creator of the universe, the one who's outside of the dimensions of time, all of a sudden we're going to sit there and say what is not what is? We know where God is at the core, but how far does he extend? That's not up for us to decide. We know who he is. We know where he is. How far does that extend? That's not us to decide. The second we start putting classifications, what's secular, what's spiritual, what's, who's Christian, who's not Christian? All I know, my core, my being, desires communion with God. And that happens through me celebrating the Eucharist, by celebrating his body and blood. And I call to be a light outside of that and continue to be him outside. I'm in no position to say where, that, where that's cut off. What's Christian? What's not Christian? What's secular? What's spiritual? I'm called to be a light. Our first core value is come as you are. People who are nothing like Jesus liked Jesus because he removed all those labels and those boundaries that society set. He removed, he obliterated all of that. And this is what made him so intriguing. This is what made him rock the world. Christians should embrace science and be the most curious people on planet Earth. It is okay to be wrong. It's okay to be wrong. 
Think about, think about what you believed to be true 10 years ago in your life. Or maybe what you were 10 years ago. Okay, we were wrong. And then we change. We grow. It's okay to be wrong. It's okay not to know. It's okay not to go, not to know. We should be the most curious and open-minded people on planet Earth. We should be the most accepting of what the world has to say and see how does this line up with my heavenly father, the creator of the universe, and not be closed. But what is not okay is not to look if there's something to be seen. Maybe we are not seeing God work in ways that we naturally, maybe from our upbringing, cultural, whatever the case might be, we've closed our mind to, to, to not wanting to see that because we have put God in a box. Throughout the centuries, church was never limited to four walls. God was never limited to just terminology. He's one above that. It's not okay not to look if there's something to be seen. In John, St. John's entire message, in his gospel, and even in his epistles, letters to early Christians, He's saying there is something to be seen. I was curious. I was hesitant. I had second doubts of who this rabbi was. But when I found out who he was, that I found out that he was God and man together, who overcame death, that's what changed my life. No one, no disciple, including St. John, was standing outside the tomb on that early Sunday morning, counting down from 10 backward, waiting for Jesus to like come out of the tomb. No one was expecting that. No one was expecting that. Because when they saw their Savior overcome death, this is where they found life. He was a fisherman, ordinary guy, didn't have much, but he had a hunger for more to life. And because of his eyewitness account, because of him recording of who Jesus was to his life, we are called to put our trust in him as well. With everything, with everything St. John saw, with everything that he saw, with him taking care of his mother, hearing all the crazy stories. I mean, just think for a second that St. John taking care of the mother of God and hearing stories from her perspective and everything that St. John saw as a young guy following Jesus up until being the last disciple to die for everything that he saw. When he sat down and with his deacon, he told, he told his deacon, hey, listen up, listen up. I need to sit there and write down the record of Jesus' life, my Savior, my God. And I want you to begin by writing this. Here are the words I'm about to say. And this is how St. John begins his gospel. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was word, the Word, which is Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. And without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. Out of any other way St. John could have started his gospel, he makes it clear that this light this word, this logos, this God, was life. And in him, we find life. And then he continues writing and highlighting various signs and of evidence that he saw of his rabbi, who he then realized was God incarnate. And then he ends his gospel by saying, I don't have enough paper to write down everything that I experienced with God. But everything I wrote is for you to have life. My prayer for us is this. For us to give the Bible another shot. For us to dive into his word through a new lens. I am curious just as he was curious. And the people whose lives were changed because of their firsthand encounter with Jesus, we are called to do the same. And my prayer for me, my prayer is for you, is that we can put our trust in what they experienced and how their life has changed, and for us to take our hunger and our curiosity for life, wanting more out of life, and put that into his word, and finding it in the love of God. As St. John said, he came to give us life. That God loved us so much that he gave his son, that whoever believes in him will have 
eternal life. Let's stand up for a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Lord, every single one of us is looking for more out of life. And maybe we try to avoid you, maybe we try to fill that gap with other things, and I'm the first to do that. Lord, help us to to, to see your gospel through a new lens, through a man, a fisherman, who is curious from wanting more and who experienced you firsthand, and we are called 2,000 years later to put our trust in his word, to put our trust in your word, to put our trust that you will heal us just as you have healed the people that you have touched. Because you are a God outside of boundaries, outside of terminology, outside of time, outside of culture, who have come to bring us healing to our marriages, to our relationships, to our career, to our personal life, to our problems. You are there to make us whole in every aspect but we need to take a leap of faith and put our trust in you just as that blind man did. He still had tons of questions, but God told him, go, and he went. And his life was never the same. And we want our new life to never be the same as our old. Through the prayers of the apostle St. John and all the apostles who were an icon and a light of yours, Lord, hear us as we all pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, guys. That wraps up our series. Just a reminder, next Sunday we have a very special eight as we're going to hear from our church members about their trip to Zambia.